partial knee replacements are a great option for the right patients. At the moment, it's only about 8% of the total replacements done for patients, whereas it could be probably as high as 47%. So there are probably patients out there getting a total knee replacement that could just have a partial knee replacement, and that could bring, give them certain benefits. Benefits of a partial knee replacement, it's a little bit of a quicker recovery. It's less that's dissected, less surgery, less involved in the knee. So you get over it a little bit quicker. Along with that, you have a little bit less pain after surgery. Because we're only operating on a portion of your body, you have less blood loss. And then only because we're replacing a certain part of your knee, the rest of the knee remains normal and feels more like a normal knee. play with a lot here in the office and this is only the lumbar spine so you have your sacrum right your tailbone again down here and you can see five four three two one this is your lumbar spine this is everything that we're talking about today i just think that this may be a slightly easier way to see how much room there actually is so if we look at this right here this is the nerve as it comes out of the spine it needs to go down out to the body and it comes across just like that if you see if i take my pen and if I put it directly in there, I can fit my entire pen in that opening, in that hole right there. That's how much room there is. You can see how much room the nerve has to move around. If we look straight down the spine, now we're looking at the spinal cord here, and you can see all of that open room around it. This is what you need in a normal spine to stay pain-free. If we grab my other model here, thank you, to make it a little obvious, they made, they made that disc herniation nice and red right in here. And you can see, I can no longer get my pen in there. It's all tight. That is the tightness that we're talking about. This is what leads to that, that nerve pain. So this is just to show you how the procedure looks on a model. Uh, we do about a half a centimeter incision and under x-ray guidance, we go in and initially remove just a little bit of bone in order to be able to get our tools inside. Once that bone is removed, we go in and remove that thickened ligament that is contributing to the narrowing of the spine. We can't really do anything about those enlarged joints or those disc bulges, but sometimes all we really need to do is open up that space and pulling back and removing some of that ligament is the purpose of the mild. Uh, and once it's all done, we close up with just a specialized band-aid called the Steri Strip. So this is our, our fake rotator cuff, like this is a, a loose flap on here. And we're gonna take this anchor. Place it into the bone. I said, we can set that anchor in place, put this in this passing device. And again, this is what we'd be reaching inside the shoulder with. And you can see that passes that through the cuff tissue and allows us to pull it out. And now same day discharge, and that's what we're talking about, is not only same day discharge, but moving the surgery from an inpatient hospital setting to an ambulatory surgery center setting. Um, so one of the questions that I would have if I were a patient or if I were a listener today, is that sounds great, but how is that possible? How do you replace someone's knee or replace someone's hip? And then they go home a couple hours later. This sounds crazy. Uh, and I admit that it does sound crazy at times. However, we've done it through really incremental improvements over the year in several, over the years in several ways. So surgical techniques, when we, we'll go back to the first hip replacement. The first hip replacements were done through a 16 to 20 inch incision through the buttocks area, it's called a posterior approach. Um, it's very invasive uh, and there was a lot of blood loss, high need for a blood transfusion. Whereas today I'm doing all of my hip replacements through an anterior approach, which is a muscle sparing approach through the front. 
uh, don't have to cut any muscle through a four inch incision with minimal blood loss. So we've, over the years, we've improved our techniques. Anesthesia techniques have improved. Most people are a little bit in shock when the doctor offers a procedure, a surgical procedure. Um, make sure that you take it seriously. Make sure that the physician is taking this seriously uh, and that they understand that uh, you're going to be an advocate for yourself. And that means you get a little notebook. You do get on the internet and read about this procedure, look at the videos, take notes. Again, you can go overboard with it and, and get too much in the weeds, and that's not helpful to you or the surgeon. But there's no reason that you should not have a little book with a variety of questions about our three main topics. And just to review them again, what exactly is the procedure they're talking about? Show me the images and how this is going to change for me. And then lastly, what sort of outcome or what, what are going to be our shared goals to go through this procedure, which in many cases causes some trauma. It can be post-traumatic, which is uh, what can result from a history of trauma to the joint, like fractures. Uh, it can be genetic and run in families, or it can be a combination of all of these. What should a patient do when they start to notice uh, symptoms like this? Well, they should see a doctor. You know, you can start with your primary care doctor who can uh, start the evaluation process, uh, maybe even start some basic treatments or eventually refer you to someone like me. Um, or you know what, if your insurance allows, you're welcome to come see us directly and we can uh, take care of you uh, with this problem and, and be with you from the journey from the start. So what does this evaluation consist of? Well, typically it would consist of a, a first a good history so you know getting good information from the patient about their symptoms when they started how they started um, what works for them what doesn't what activities are the most uncomfortable followed by a good physical exam of the patient and of the specific uh, body part we almost always will get x-rays uh, and sometimes we'll even get some advanced imaging like like uh, an mri or a ct scan if needed Just to summarize, many types of knee pain are quite treatable. Um, we do have good solutions for a lot of different types of knee pain. Um, and so people should feel empowered, I think, to, to try and seek treatment if they are having knee pain that hasn't resolved on its own or that has gone on to affect their quality of life and that they feel as though is robbing them of something in their life. Um, and I do want to reiterate, the first line of treatment does not necessarily involve surgery. Um, you know, we want to try other things first uh, surgery is just for those cases where it continues to be a problem and that there's um, uh, and that there's not a lot of other options left. Let's see, I'm going to get myself still in here. We are. So we have this whole system in the operating room and what um, what we're doing is basically trying to hit a bullseye and what you're seeing on the screen, the yellow is the drill coming in. Uh, we're drilling in this particular instance, we're using an augmented component and we want to make sure our alignment is really correct. So once I get that kind of perfect center center. And that's where we are. So that just gives you a, an idea um, of the technology and its use and its uh, ability to help us. Shoulder replacements are a little more complicated than hips and knees because there are two different types of shoulder replacements that we can have. One of them is something called an anatomic replacement. And I have a model over here of an anatomic replacement. What an anatomic replacement is, is a replacement where we replace the ball of the shoulder and the socket of the shoulder with parts that look just like what you originally had, but they're metal and plastic. You get an anatomic replacement when the rotator cuff is in good shape and when you don't have a lot of deformities in the shoulder joint itself. This is kind of like a traditional hip or knee replacement. The parts are similar in shape, but they're made out of metal and plastic. So that's an anatomic replacement. A reverse replacement is very different. Reverse replacements look nothing like the parts that you originally have. They're shaped differently. We place the socket 
on the humeral side or the arm bone side, and we put the ball on the end of the shoulder blade. This is an example of a reverse shoulder replacement. The ball is on the shoulder blade now, and the socket is on the arm bone side. The deltoid muscle moves the reverse shoulder replacement. 